The Holy Gospels recorded in the book of John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands. Put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Do not disbelieve, do not doubt, but believe. Pretty cut and dry, don't you think? In fact, I'll tell you what, it's even clearer and uglier in the original Greek, where we hear Jesus tell Thomas, do not be unbelieving, but rather believe. Now, I know we can all pile on Thomas for doubting the good news of the resurrection, and we we often do. We hear the words of our Lord after he gave Thomas the proof that he was demanding, and, you know, Jesus says, Blessed are they who don't see and yet believe. We hear these words, and our inner Pharisee just can't help but pat ourselves on the back and say, That's me. You know, thank God I'm not like Thomas. He needed to see before he would believe. Thank God I'm not doubting Thomas. Now, let's face it, too. This is how he'll forever be known. You know, not repentant Thomas, not Saint Thomas, not Apostle Thomas, not faithful missionary and holy martyr Thomas, all of which are absolutely true, by the way. No, nope, he is forever doubting Thomas. But still, okay, to, to, to say that he was unbelieving Thomas, well, that just seems like it goes a bit too far, doesn't it? I mean, it's so judgmental and harsh. Never mind the fact that this is exactly what Jesus says here, unbelieving. But, you know, we don't, even, we don't want to get into that. Unbelieving Thomas just doesn't sit well with us. Perhaps this is why we soften up the English translation to say, you know, stop disbelieving or stop doubting. Disbelief, doubt, that just doesn't sound as harsh and judgmental as unbelieving, does it? You know, it, it, it calls attention to a problematic issue, but it doesn't make it a whole big, ugly, sinful, unbelieving thing. And I say all this for good reason, too. Deep down, we all have kind of a soft spot for Thomas, don't we? I mean, after all, we can all relate. Deep down, we understand his doubts and his protestations. We understand his his desire, his insistence for proof. We get it. You know, things don't work the way he's being told they're working. Jesus was crucified. He knows this. Jesus was declared dead by Roman soldiers, and those guys don't make mistakes. When it comes to putting people to death, these guys were professionals. You know, Jesus went to his grave, holes in his hands, holes in his feet, a gaping wound in his side. He died. He was buried. We know where the tomb is, Thomas is saying. You know, people don't just rise from the dead. This is not how things work. You're not going to make a fool out of me. Unless I see, I will never believe. 
Now, I don't think any of us here are foolish enough to say that we condone the doubt and the unbelief of Thomas, but we understand it, don't we? We're, we're sympathetic to it in a way. Besides, you know, if we're going to define Thomas's resistance to believe, if we're going to define his insistence for proof, if we're going to define all that as unbelief, well, then what does that mean for us? I mean, we'd have to say that we'd have to say the same exact thing about ourselves, about our doubts, our protestations. We'd have to say the same thing about our unbelief. We say, oh, unbelief? Well, never. Me, right? I mean, how dare somebody make that accusation against me? You know what, though? Rather than pick on Thomas, which is either going to lead, I mean, it's going to lead to two things. Rather than pick on Thomas, which is either going to cause us to make excuses for his unbelief and our unbelief, or worse yet, it's going to get us looking down our pietistic noses at him as if we're better than him or holier than him. Rather than do all this, let us consider his great confession of faith. We're not going to pick on doubting or unbelieving Thomas today. Nope. We're going to praise faithful, repentant St. Thomas. My Lord and my God, if you pay attention to the text, these, these are the first and only words out of Thomas's mouth after he's confronted with the truth of the Lord of life. That's it. All right. Thomas doesn't try to offer up excuses or explanations for his unbelief. No, my Lord and my God. That's it. It's one of the simplest yet most profound and greatest confessions of faith in all of Holy Scripture. What does it mean? Have you ever given it any thought? Probably not, because, well, like I said, we're usually too busy measuring ourselves up against Thomas's doubts and unbelief. You know, we're, we're too busy patting ourselves on the back because, well, thank God we're not like Thomas. You know, we see and we don't, you know, we don't see and yet we believe. You guys, remember what your Lord has already said about uh, such holier-than-thou attitude. And I quote, comes out of Matthew, With the judgment that you pronounce against others, you will be judged. The measure that you use to judge and condemn others, that will be measured against you. Okay, so before you start measuring the holiness and faithfulness and reverence of Thomas, or, or anyone else for that matter, hold that measuring stick up to yourself. Better yet, try seeing how you uh, measure up against God's perfect and holy measuring stick. I'm going to tell you how it's going to turn out. You will come up short, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. My Lord and my God. Okay, Lord, that word Lord bespeaks authority, superiority. To say that Jesus is your Lord is to also say that you belong to him. He is your master. He is your owner. You are his humble slave. And don't go all 21st century stupid on me by thinking only in terms of that reprehensible institution that was 19th century slavery. That is not what this word means. To be a slave of God, a doulos of God, it's a good thing. To be independent is not a good thing, not in Scripture. You know, for one thing, independence is a demonic illusion. No one is truly independent or autonomous, a, a law unto themselves. As St. Paul says very clearly in Romans, you are either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. That's it. Either sin, death, and the grave are your masters, or the Lord of life and his perfect righteousness is your master. That's it. You know, and in terms of ownership, again, St. Paul speaks very clearly of the fact that we've been bought with a price. We've been purchased from the bonds of sin, death, and the grave, that redeeming price being the blood of God's only begotten Son. Because of Christ, we've been set free from being slaves to sin. Not, not set free to do whatever we want, but set free to become slaves of his righteousness. You know, by virtue of our baptism into Christ, there's this wonderful transfer of ownership. We now belong to God. He's our owner, our master. He's our Lord and Savior. This is Thomas's confession. My Lord and my God. Now, to call Jesus not just God, but my God, that's no small thing either. 
Now, again, Thomas is confessing the fact that Jesus is the Almighty in the flesh. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning and the end. You know, our Lord himself says, you shall have no other gods. And Luther says, all right, well, what does this mean? It means you should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Luther would go on to explain that anything that is most important to you is basically your God. Thomas is confessing here that Jesus is his God. There is nothing more important to Thomas than the living, victorious Lord of life. My Lord, my God. With these simple yet very profound words, Thomas is confessing how his fallen reason, his intellect, all his wants and desires and likes and dislikes, he's confessing how all of this has been taken captive and subjugated to his Lord and his God. All of that garbage has been relegated to a distant second place. My Lord and my God, nothing comes first, not even close. And as history, as tradition tells us, Thomas would go on to live out the remainder of his life putting this very confession into practice. Traveling to India as a missionary, dying the martyr's death in service to his Lord and God. Nothing would come before Jesus, not even his own life or well-being. Ah, but now comes the big question. What about you? As I said, we're, we're very good at piling on doubting Thomas, but can his confession honestly be said to be your confession? And I'll caution you, think before you speak. Is Jesus your Lord? Okay, as you know the word now, Lord, is Jesus your Lord, or do other things still have mastery over you? Is Jesus your God, or are other false gods and idols coming before him? You know, are they on the receiving end of your worship and allegiance? You are known by the fruits you bear. Okay? Uh, we, we won't even speak here about the false gods of money and materialism and lust and sensuality. I mean, those are easy to pick on. <laughs> and yet we, we still will deny their mastery over us. But we, we won't go there. We won't even talk about it. What about pride? What about the opposite of sinful pride? What about humility, meekness, lowliness? You know, like your Lord and your God. The slave's not above the master, right? You know what your Lord and God has already said about loving him and loving your neighbor, which, by the way, does include everyone, not just the people you like. You know what your Lord and God has said about loving others just as you've been loved, forgiving others just as you've been forgiven. So examine yourself. You know, ask yourself, are your emotions and desires and oh-so-precious feelings, are these things taken captive and subjugated to the divine word of mercy and grace? Or do you still come first? And, you know, you'll just ask for forgiveness later. You know, maybe not even at all. I mean, after all, why would you ask for forgiveness if you're not wrong? <laughs> yeah, I mean, guys, do we need to break out God's measuring stick here? I want you to look to this cross. Look at this cross of your Lord, your God, your Savior, your Redeemer. What has this almighty Lord and God already said? He said it is finished, right? The price for your redemption, the wage for your sin, has been paid in full by him once and for all time. It is finished. Folks, this is the same victorious word of God in resurrected flesh who bids Thomas to touch and see and believe. It's this same victorious word of God in the flesh who comes to us today in, with, and under these, these mere and unassuming means of his word, water, bread, and wine. You know, it's strange to think about. It even seems a bit contradictory. You know, Jesus himself declares, blessed are those who believe and yet have not seen, and yet he still comes to us in very real and tangible forms so that we can see, right? So that we can see and touch and taste and feel. Wow, what do you know? I, uh, we're no different than Thomas. You know, just like Thomas, our Lord comes to us. He comes to us 
in the midst of our pride and our arrogance, our weakness. He comes to us in the midst of our doubts and despairs. And he bids us to come and taste and see that he is our very present Lord and God. You look no further than right here. Look to this altar. Look and listen to his word and promise. As often as you do this, remember what I have said. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sin. And, and how does the faith, which purely by God's grace and the working of the Holy Spirit has been taken captive by his word, subjugated to him who died and rose again, reigns victorious in our midst. How does this captive, subjugated faith respond to all this good news? How does this faith, which the Lord him life, the Lord of life himself praises as blessed, how does this faith respond to all this? My Lord and my God. Folks, may this powerful, beautiful confession, may this be your confession too now and always. Right? May it not just be empty words, but, but may this confession be living and active, witnessed in all that you say and do, as you, in repentant joy and thanksgiving, bear good and God-pleasing fruits to his praise and glory. Love as you've been loved. Forgive as you've been forgiven. My Lord and my God. Amen.